murdering Sherlock for the sake of girl power. We're going to be walking along on a journey here that uh, began. I was not aware of. I was aware of this movie that was coming out called Enola Holmes. I was aware of seeing the trailer. Well, I've seen people's reactions to the tra trailer and through it. And the tra trailer, that's the... I'm only paying attention for the lulls, <coughs> for the most part. And then this drop by As here from Heel vs. Babyface As, by the way. I love As. Really watch As with regularity. And As is, uh, okay, he's one of these YouTubers that <clears throat> if you've seen this topic covered by a gazillion people already, you're still waiting to hear what As says. Because As is awesome. And as is a way of delivering things that uh, make you proud to be an American, even though he's not American still. <clears throat> Makes me proud to be American when I listen to that man talk. And this is, for the most part, I'm going to agree with his sort of take, but I'm going to be using as as a bit of a, well, I'm going to be kind of critiquing as, but not in any kind of moralistic, certainitarian, whatever kind of uh, way, but maybe in a... I'm going to suggest to As <coughs> and many others there might be a different approach to dealing with this and uh, that perhaps conversations that they're have, well, that they're having really are dancing on the surface of uh, issues underneath that are far more, uh, well, emboldening and empowering of folks that <coughs> have very different designs for how the world should be constructed and how humans should live and the nature of authority. And what not. Somehow, this begins with this Edge <clears throat> by Sylvia Plath. That's right. You're going to have to trust me here, but I'm reading this poem to you. This is not my poem, obviously. I am not Sylvia Plath. Full disclosure, I was uh, pretty much obsessed with Sylvia Plath from the ages of 19 to roughly speaking 22. So from those ages, those three years, Sylvia Plath was everything to me. My whole life resolved about around understanding her. <clears throat> Fantasizing about going back in time and meeting her and, and being the, the one that prevented her from even meeting Ted Hughes in the first place. There's a the long story there. If you don't know Sylvia Plath had Ted Hughes, Sylvia Plath is, well, she truly is a, 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 a woman who who represents in so many ways a bridge between where we are now and where we were but it wasn't enough of where we are now for her to be able to survive given the nature of who and what she was and, well we'll get to that <clears throat> this is what I'm setting up Edge by Sylvia Plath the woman is perfected her dead body wears the smile of accomplishment the illusion of a Greek necessity flows in the scrolls of her toga. Her bare feet seem to be saying, We have come so far, it is over. Each dead child coiled, a white serpent, one at each little pitcher of milk, now empty. She has folded them back into her body as petals, of a rose close when the garden stiffens and the odors bleed from the sweet, deep throats of the night flower. The moon has nothing to be said about, staring from her hood of bone. She is used to this sort of thing. Her blacks crackle and drag, allegedly. Allegedly. I added that on there for whatever. Sylvia Plath. <clears throat> Tell you a little bit about dear Sylvia Plath. First off, let's switch on over here to give you a view of our, our lady. Sivvy, as she was commonly known to by her friends. Look at that girl. Beautiful girl. Her father was... Uh, <coughs> Uh, an ornithologist and a beekeeper and a bit of a brute the stereotypical patriarchal male if you will she was a brilliant perfectionist <coughs> young girl who was 
born, <laughs> if there could be such a thing, eating and breathing <clears throat> poetry. She wrote a, one novel and some short stories, but in general, it's poetry. Her novel is only significant because of her poetry to me. I mean, her novel's competent and good enough in and of itself to Belchar, but uh, it was really special just because of her. And Johnny Panic and the Bible Dreams, a novella. It's pretty cool, pretty wild. I think that uh, had she not died in 1963, that uh, she might have developed further. And I have no doubt if she really wanted to be a master short story, story writer, she would have, but she would have probably, because she certainly had the, 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 the native writing skills and not, I mean, poetic, and she could write, she could write a prose sentence. She could write a prose sentence. Not all poets can write prose sentences, but uh, she could. She married Ted Hughes. She was expected at that time, still, and this is 1960-ish thereabouts, goes on over to England. <clears throat> Pretty quickly affects a British accent, by the way, which is somewhat annoying, but still, just because it's Sylvia Plath, it doesn't matter, because she's uh, totally, uh, in all ways, shapes, and form. This was, uh, for the longest time, what I believed to be the paradigm of a woman for me. Uh, so she is the, the height of a woman in my eyes, at least when I was 19 to 22, and still I regard her as uh, one of the greats who was uh, stuff, st st stuffed out or snifled out. Why well, not sni snifled? Uh, stifled. Huh. I was I was combining snuffed out and stifled in my mind. I I literally had snuffled, snuffled. She was snuffled. That's not good. Don't be snuffled. No matter how you slice it, that can't be good. So, <clears throat> she is one of these folks that, here she is. She has uh, risen in her, and she's remembered, and her poetry is now legend. And uh, she has a huge following, much more than when she was alive. She's one of the few poets that have broken through in any way to mainstream cultural awareness very very few poets have done that and almost all of the poets have have i would say are are pedestrians in terms of their wordsmithing and they usually only really capture a finite zeitgeist that uh, after it passes their their art is no longer relevant she's one of the few in my eyes that is it is of the highest level of uh uh certainly linguistic craft and uh just an extraordinary poet that I mean at the technical level at the uh, highest uh, <clears throat> the 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 ranges of uh, implied and not so uh, well directly not not so implied but directly the, the ranges of themes and philosophical constructs and psychological battles that are contained in many of the characters that she creates in herself and being what some people call the bitch goddess which i used to love calling her the bitch goddess because that was that 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 i did not use the word bitch in any kind of pejorative way bitch to me at that time was like kind of an empowering word when i thought about her as as a quote unquote bitch goddess bitch goddess is the key bitch goddess you can't uh, you can't deny that at least this is my 22 year old self so and this is only she died in 1963 i discovered her in 1987 so it was only 26 years after her death although at that time 26 years seemed like it was a lot longer than it does today in terms of human scale so it wasn't long after her death in in relative human history that i discovered her and it was such a painful discovery because I was totally in love with her. I had a mad, mad... I mean, she was... I was in, totally in love with her. And uh, I, I wrote songs about her. I wrote a whole... I wrote a, a nine-page poem called The Western Wench, which was my first really serious effort at writing what I called <laughs> contemporary poetry, not realizing contemporary still just meant of the age. So it really doesn't really define a school it defines the time relevance of the school that you're writing in a contemporary school of poetry for instance and for her she was she's not even contemporary anymore Contem confessional poetry the school of thought that she comes or the school poetry school of poetry that she really represents 
is con so-called confessional poetry. Confessional poetry is basically, it's the poetry where you use your own life as the backdrop of the, uh, on, that was a relative <clears throat> to be directly using your life so obviously in, and in such a naked way, transparent way. That was the revo revolutionary thought. But I don't really think of her as a confessional poet because I just think of her as a, a high wordsmith, high high crafted, I mean, her, her she's a Logodedalus. I, I ran a poetry magazine called Logodedalus. <clears throat> and uh, she was a, she's a Logodedalus of the highest order. And her poetry reflects multiple schools of thought. If you really knew the schools of thought but they range from imagism to surrealism to uh i, I don't know uh, uh there's elements of horus in her there's there's so many different elements uh, throughout the ages of poets in her work she's truly just a reflection of someone who 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 uh who understood instinctively the potential for language to create patterns beyond her intentions, beyond even her intellectual capacity, which I think most poet like this is what you seek to almost achieve as a poet. But her poetry is remembered, and the poetry got out there. But she was still expected to serve a role, and the role is housewife. Raise the kids. Let's get back to Az here now. Let's get back to Oz here. In Ola Holmes, her mother vanished. Her brothers, Sherlock and Mycroft, useless. No. The reason why I inverted commas in Ola Holmes as Sherlock's sister is she wasn't created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. She was uh, a creator of Nancy Springer or something in 2006 for a series of YA stories uh, which ran until about 2010. So the character is only 14 years old. That's it. We have had a hundred plus years almost of Sherlock Holmes. Beloved Sherlock Holmes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's get on back to uh, another person. We're going to talk about, I just want to just prepare you for this. We're going to be talking about, oh, well, this woman here, Maria Anna Mozart. We're going to compare her story to Sylvia Plath. But before we do that, we're going we're gonna to bring Az back because Az isn't done here. Az has more to tell you about this universe because Netflix has uh well they've gone all out to really really uh drive home exactly what this movie is about the message the message the message girl power girl power so Netflix have and this is their own words here inspired by Sherlock's sister new newly created sister in 2006 Enola Holmes we installed statues in cities around the UK celebrating the real life sisters of famous figures whose prestigious achievements have been overshadowed in the history books by their more widely known brothers. And look, they've put these statues of a freaking Karen with her hands on her hips. Hands on hips. With a, a, a look of a bulldog licking piss yep. off a thistle, <laughs> staring at the patriarchy. Oh, mm. oh, she's stealing my she's, thunder. She's condemning. Look at that. This is a look of absolute hatred. How dare you? How dare you take my. That is my rightful place. This legendary patriarchal figure, Sherlock Holmes, is only there. <clears throat> because of a little girl named Enola who was invented in 2006. This fictional character took the glory of a fictional character that was created based on him 100 plus years after, I don't know when Holmes was created, 
Arthur Conan Doyle, but I think over a hundred years. In the late 1800s, 1880s, or something, I'm going to get. Let's see. Let's see. When was Sherlock Holmes invented? Sherlock Holmes invented. Sherlock Holmes invented. Year. There we go. <clears throat> 1980s. Hey, I said 1880s. Hey, not bad. Not bad. Proud of myself for that one. So, anyway, they're not done. They're not done. They're not done. Let's keep on. And they're all the same, by the way. They're all the same model, just with a different bottom to the skirt or go. dress there or whatever. Go. There you go. Ridiculous. Yeah. Now then, one of these is even funnier. They've got they've got this one here, Princess Helena Victoria, sister of King Edward the Seventh. Great, she did something. Wow. Did her go. did her brother hold her back? No, likely not. It was the way of the royal succession. Uh, Marianne Mozart. Go. Oh, Mozart. Well, he was just all right, wasn't he? Wasn't his? He's a musical genius. Or anything like that. She ha often received top billing, but as she grew older. Cultural pressures made it impossible for her to continue her career. Context? More? No. Okay. Generalization. Alrighty then, let's go and uh, let's go deeper. Where are we at? Where is she? Oh my gosh, where is? Did I X out of her? Alrighty then, I X'd out of her. Mozart's sister. Mozart's sister. There we go. Sorry about this, folks. I apologize to no one. There she is. Wait, you're not the right one. There we go. It's... Okay, that's not the right one. Dude, I had this. I had this, man. I had this. Okay. Let's, uh, maybe this is the right one. That's not the right picture. Oh, there is. That's the picture I had. I prayed her. There she is as a child, Marianne Mozart. And there she is as an older woman. Now, Marianne Mozart, her story is a little different than Sylvia Plath. Sylvia Plath, we have her writings. And she was given a degree of space to operate within, but it was still expected that it would be a limited space. Her husband, Ted Cruz, could be her Ted Cruz. <laughs> her husband, Ted Hughes. So you see the sound there? Uh, and he's very, he's, he, well, Ted Hughes is a, is a jerkus, jerkosaurus, uh, subjectively speaking. Maybe objectively, I don't know. If there is objective jerkosaurus, I'm sure Ted Hughes would be first in line. Uh, but Ted Hughes, male, 1963, fully expected. He, he, he was expected, he could run off on his own leave the wife behind and, ex and and fully expected that it would be okay for the man, even though both the man and the woman are both working at the same high level, the same type of career, it was fully expected that the female would be the one that would sacrifice her career for the children, not the male. That was expected. So her, her ability to continue to develop in the path that she was developing at this high level, world-class level, was going to be sincerely, seriously impeded by the cultural, social cultural expectation that she be the primary provider of care, unless she's uh, wealthy. And these poets weren't wealthy. Ted, Ted Hughes and so forth, neither one of these were making tons of money from anything remotely associated with poetry outside of being able to be professors at colleges. Nobody was selling hundreds of cop thousands and thousands of copies of any kind of poetry that these folks were writing back then. This is for academia. This is academia writing for academia, which, like I said earlier, it's extraordinary that somehow this poet coming from that world became mainstream. So it's really awesome. Well, from my perspective. So there you got Maria and Mozart, though. She had a different story. She went around with Leopold, and uh, was she better than Mozart? I mean, that's... 
what they'll imply that oh you know she went around she's just like better than Wolfgang was she better or just as good maybe she was uh, now they did say in the early days she sometimes received top billing uh, so Leopold took her and Wolfgang on tours to show Geisler. In the early days, she would sometimes receive top billing, and she was known as an ep- excellent harpsichordist and fort- forte pianist. That's this like little piano thingy. However, she was not allowed to pursue that because it was not expect. It certainly was not expected of. Uh, of a, of, of a family, whether they were part of the gentry or the aristocracy or not, they aspired to be. So they behaved like they were. So they would not want their ladies to be perceived as going around doing something as low-born as, as composing for money, composing for the pleasure of others. It's unseemly for a woman to do such things. Not unseemly for a man, but unseemly for a woman. And so, this this girl, it is alleged that she wrote musical compositions here, uh, according to Wikipedia, and there are letters from Wolfgang praising her work, but the voluminous correspondence of her father never mentions any of her compositions. None have survived, so we don't have any of her works. If she did, she wrote. Maybe she was better than Wolfgang, even. Maybe she was like, I mean, if for me the the height of musical perce- perfection is is uh the requiem the whole requiem mass listen to that thing from beginning to end it's extraordinary it just it just does you in when i was uh actually in this period of time when i was in love with sylvia plath it was in that period of time that i i suddenly i, I hated ca- classical music and i was i didn't come from a cultured world I came from uh, well, well, you know, I, I grew up, I grew up in uh, uh, orphanages and broken homes and crap like that. Not, never an orf, not an orphan, but long story. But so I didn't grow up around the knowledge of such things and exposure to such things. But when I discovered the requiem when I was 19, discovered a lot of things when I was 19. That that destroyed me. And then suddenly now, I'm still not a huge classical music fan, but I do love classical music now in large part because of that. And if she wrote better than him and she could produce something better than that, I mean, I can't imagine, I just can't imagine what the world has missed out. Even if she wrote something that's as good or even not quite as good, just not quite as good, it's still extraordinary. So we still missed out. And we missed out on a lot of these people throughout the ages, these these ladies that uh, have been diminished because we have these... uh, constructs that uh, uh, let me stop myself this is where I'm getting the actual point <sighs> I'm gonna tell you about women's MMA now <laughs> women's MMA this is where we're at now this is women's MMA when does the women's MMA get a, get the rise you know, a few years ago when, when when's uh, Ronda Rousey Let's see if they show this at all. Do you show the rise of Rousey? The rise of Rousey. 2011. He said never, never, never. That's what he said. Never, 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 never. And then uh, she fought in 2012. It was going to happen. The USC's first female champion will defend her new title against Liz Kalmarsh in the main event. She was going to be in the main event. February 23rd, 2013. And uh, that's where it begins. And we are now only... Almost eight years. Seven plus whatever years. Months. Seven years plus months. I remember when I first saw women's MMA. It was before that. Maybe around 2009. Something like that. It was an anomaly and the first time I saw it it was very difficult for me to watch because it was women beating each other and it was tough by about the third or fourth time I saw it I was over it I really was I was no longer interested in or I was no longer even worried about women hurting women (laughs) that sounds terrible but it's pretty significant in the shift of how I looked at women and I've always been, for a lot of other, for a lot of reasons, I've always been kind of inclined to be looking to make sure that women aren't being 
forced into roles that they're not comfortable with. And, and maybe in some part just because of how much I fell in love with Sylvia Plath and how much I knew it was pretty transparent to me just how much that woman's life was diminished and how she ended up. I'm not saying she did the right thing by killing herself. I think she still could have overcome and figured out a way to make it work more than she thought, but I could understand why she could imagine that it couldn't. And it was a terrible choice that she was kind of forced into. She didn't have any option. No, no. I mean, she did have options, but she had very few real options. And all of these options would, would have involved incredible sacrifice at, at multiple levels, including significant social exception sacrifices. And then there's women's MMA. And we get 1963, we get a woman whose work is preserved. And in 2020, some of the best fighters in the world. Now, I don't mean in terms of matching them up like a women. The best of the women will not ever beat the best of the men in physical com conflict, like co co combat sports, direct combat sports such as this. But in terms of athleticism and drama and the entertainment that uh, and the high quality that is offered in terms of the demonstrated skills the sophistications for me women are better entertainers when it comes to mixed martial arts i mean a, a women's fight the best of a woman's fight is better and more entertaining to me than the best of a men's fight they're in general these ladies are more vicious far more vicious than the men. <laughs> they're far more resilient than the men. And their ground game, their grappling, there's levels to what they do that men can't even dream of. It's because of the, the they have physical advantages, agility and uh, stuff. They have advantages and it really comes through in the grappling in a lot of ways, the jiu-jitsu and whatnot. And it's it's fundamentally shifted our view of women for significantly more and more numbers of, of males that now must come to terms with the fact that they are entertained by women who are demonstrating traditional male aggressiveness and hostility in poetic ways, if you will. And that's the world that we really live in. The shift has happened. We are no longer where Netflix wants you to believe that we are. Where all of these hysterian idiots want you to believe we are. We are. We are nowhere near what Marie, but what the Mozart's sister had to endure. We're nowhere near what Sylvia Plath's, uh, what Sylvia Plath had to endure. We are far beyond that. And you want to take us back and to 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 convince humanity that this is still a horrible epidemic that women are not able to choose a path that is different from the tradition outlined but meanwhile you do it in a way in which you're not you're not lifting up anyone oh, you you create and i'm sure nine nine times out of ten it's going to be another one of these quote unquote Mary Sue girls because they can't have gotten their skills by anyone else outside that must come from within. This power of this woman power is completely wound from within. They don't need anyone outside the world. They are the creator in a sense. And so she will be a Mary Sue because she has to be just to show how it all comes internally from her. No male was needed. No society was needed. No, they were only hindrances. The traditional societies, all of this. This is this is a weapon. This is a the declaration of war against what is. This is not defense of of women and and seeking to lift women up and to be able to uh, fulfill non traditional roles. And you can just see that's bullshit. It's total bullshit. Women have all the capacity now to choose non-traditional roles. What you want to do is stigmatize traditional roles. You are against the quote-unquote patriarchy. Listen, I'm just going to tell you this. There are many people that prefer the patriarchy. 
and human beings my suspicion is human beings will continue to to produce probably the vast majority of humans will probably uh, incline be inclined to be to have healthier and happier lives under a patriarchy system than a matriarchy system for, for a number of reasons it has nothing to do with the inherent worth of male or female and it has everything to do with the practical reality that males kill and females don't and unless and until you get rid of the killings uh, you won't get rid of that, that that reality patriarchies are the most effective forms of governance for the vast majorities of nation states any nation state that has a non-patriarchal system will not produce killers and they will eventually be taken over by nation states that do produce killers so you're going to have to get rid of the nation state model altogether and you're not going to do it by trying to do what what happened to Marianne Mariana Mariana the problem is not that we have these constructs that women we expect our women to do certain things or we expect our men to do certain things because there's a lot of men by the way that w that were forced into as Maria Maria Anna was forced into uh, being a mom uh, other boys were were being forced into being soldiers and they just wanted to write poetry too there was a lot of poets that died on battlefields so uh, this 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 notion that the, what they want to create for you is this notion that it was very selective oppression of the ability of individuals to be what they wanted to be. And you're dancing on the surface, and so are you as in what you're doing and what you're critiquing. Although I understand why you're angry, I understand the outrage, because you are recognizing this is war. They're not lifting up a young girl. They are inventing a character out of whole cloth I don't know what the 2006 version is, but it seems like by their own marketing, they have invented a character, taking a character out of whole cloth. It, it, it's just torn from the rib of Sherlock, m metaphorically speaking. And they're going to use that rib girl as as a sword to, to stab Sherlock in the heart. So their idea of liberating women is murdering men and, and, and giving you a lie, a lie that this this uh, coercive nature of patriarchalism that that uh, that is unique to the patriarchy that is unique to males this is a evil amongst it's very unique amongst males coerciveness in general is the underlying problem here as it's not why or who it's that they assume a coercive starting point a, a coercive starting point which is in order for them to achieve what they hope to achieve which is equality males must be entirely and completely discredited for anything that uh, that might have been attributed to them and all of the glory must go to the female and we must we must force everyone we must coerce everyone it doesn't matter how naturally or unnaturally you may or may not fit we must coerce everyone into the new cultural reality which is this uh all this twisted dark crop that starts off with assumptions of whiteness being the number one evil that we must get rid of in the world and maleness being a close second you have an ideology of of murder and hate and you don't even need to address them anymore as neither does uh, neither does any of them. Although, if you do, I would be disappointed from an entertainment standpoint. And I ain't sweating you if you continue at all. I'm just saying strategically. There's another way. And the other way is we just stop paying attention. We stop talking about them. And we just start talking about people and promoting and supporting people that are doing crap, that are serving an audience, that are creating a product that serves an audience rather than creating a product intended to coercively create an audience, <laughs> create people. See, this in all the homes, this is coercive agitprop intended to 
leave you with the impression that men are evil and that the injustices in the world are all basically because men don't allow women to be who and what they naturally are. Never mind that the fundamental underlying problem is the nature, the notion that anyone's moral constructs or social value systems of any kind should be coercively imposed upon anyone else, whether you're using gun, government gun power directly, as in political power, or whether you're using gov government gun power indirectly, as in uh, monopolistic market power however you're using or whether you're using the the social shaming power whatever which ultimately is market because if you do social shaming you pretty much destroy an individual's ability to make a living that's murder that's attempted murder at the very least you're trying to kill that person and that's the world that we live in that's what all this type of stuff uh, devolves towards so i believe that we should stop talking about them and what they say and what they do and we should ta start talking about people that are doing things that provide products for customers instead of providing coercive agit prop to try to deceptively create people in their twisted perverse image and uh, I think uh, I think that's how I'm gonna leave this. I think get that come on, get that title up there. Yeah. So I think that's that's all I have to say. I knew this was going to be a long one ahead of time. I prepped it in advance and I said this is gonna be over thirty minutes long. And sure enough it is over thirty minutes long, which I expected this one to be. So I hope you enjoyed this one. And uh, thank you very much for listening and listen everybody. Everyone listen, have have a great rest of your day. Um, because why not choose, just choose, have a great day, choose. <laughs>